Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this video we are going to be taking a look at the superb Epitaph of a Small Winner by Machado Giacis. It is brilliant. So without further ado, let's get stuck in, shall we? Epitaph of a Small Winner by Machado Giacis is a spectacular book. Also, this particular Bloomsbury edition has just the most gorgeous cover on it. It's, um, I don't know if you can see that, but um, it's a lot of red skulls in, in somewhat like pirate hats. And then there's this one just here, which is blue and it's smiling. And the reason for that is Salman Rushdie said of this book, it has the kind of humour that makes skulls smile. And the book itself, it's, it's beautifully bound. Um, it's one of those books that would just fall open quite easily. And the font, the font is excellent. It's a good size and you've got great margins around the edge if you want to take notes or stick post-its in, that kind of thing. So as regards this particular book, I will put a link in the description where to find it on Amazon. And I believe in America, the cover is a bit different. So I will put up a picture here for you to see the American version. But what a book. You know, Hamlet, when he, he got all deep and meditative and reflective, and he said, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is nobler in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea, a sea of troubles. That's what he said. It's hard to remember these things. Well, that quote pretty much sums up what this book is about, except that Brass Cubas, the narrator in this book, doesn't have the whole to be or not to be, whether it is nobler in mind. This has nothing to do with nobler in mind. It's just, how do you deal with life? Do you just succumb to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Or do you take arms against the sea of troubles? And all the way through, he is so irreverent because he takes the perspective of looking back on his life from after he's died. So he's, as a narrator, he's dead talking about the life he's lived. Now, if you want to just have a quick overview of this with absolutely no spoilers, you might want to go and see, I'll put the link here, um, I do a very quick review of it in a book haul that I did. So have a look there. Now, what's remarkable about this book, although it seems like a serious topic, um, the summing up of one's life, the vicissitudes of life, Brass Cubas in this book just makes you giggle so much because of his irreverent, light-hearted take on how horrendous life can be. Sometimes it's got ups, often it's got downs, and he gets wound up quite a lot with various things that don't go his way. And yet he has such a flippant attitude towards it. And it's not because from his perspective, he thinks life is flippant. It's because you can see that even after death, he's still the same kind of personality as when he was alive. Going deep into Epitaph of the Small Winner, um, is hard because remarkably the book is all surface. There's everything that needs to be said is right there in front of you. It's done in 160 chapters over the course of 209 pages. So of course that's a lot of small chapters and at least two of them have no words in, which despite that being the case make absolute sense. What you have is Braz Cubas after death reflecting on his life. He starts a little bit about being on his deathbed just before passing, um, but then he starts to recollect, right, let's go back to my youth. And as a child, life is just life. You don't have any awareness of anything around you except your own feelings and your own immediate family. He's indulged by his father and he just trots along doing his own thing, going to school and that, with no recognition of consequences. So there's this scene in which he, at a party, he catches as a child um, 
a man and a, a girl in the bushes having a little canoodle. And they're not married. The man's already married to someone else. And he comes out and just announces to the party that they're in the bushes kissing. Well, of course, that's going to really disrupt someone else's life. But he says it slightly out of spite, but with no knowledge of the full consequences. And that sort of just sets the tone because it's quite an amusing, you sort of slap your head thinking, oh no, fancy that happening. And from there, he begins to develop his life. But it's not this simple sequential sequence that goes forward. It's ridiculously haphazard. Um, Machado Giacis is constantly getting Bras Cubas to go off topic, to take tangents, to be distracted by a detail. And the things he cho chooses to record, E.M. Forster, talking of um, a story in time, says that it's not just the, the, the length of time or the, the, the strict order of events, but it's a matter of intensity. It's where certain parts of the story or certain parts of life condense to a pinnacle. This is what we're interested in. And Brass Cubas from Beyond Death is just recollecting certain moments where he recollects, oh yes, that was an interesting point in my life. Overall, Brass Cubas is a bit of a, a waster. You know, he goes to university, travels from Brazil over to Portugal, goes to university, but when he, he <laughs> when he writes about it, he says, university wasn't a complete waste of time. He said, I got three lines from Virgil and at least two lines from Horace that I could remember for the rest of my life. But what a waste of time. He falls in love. He talks about this girl, Marcella, who is beautiful, and he meets her. And before he goes this one time, he's at her house, he just grabs her and kisses her. And he says, I can't remember if she said anything or screamed. He says, but I know I left there in a whirlwind of happiness. And then he is addicted to her and buys her lots of gifts. Well, she's a bit of a gold digger. She lets him buy these things. And he has, you know, some amorous trysts with her. And he wants to marry her. And he says, let's run away together. Of course, she just laughs. She's not really interested in him or what she can get. And there's many boys and men who are interested in her. But of course, she is everything to him in his youth. And then in school, he's got this other character, uh, Chinkas Borbas, um, who's a really popular kid. He's got a good family and he always plays the king or the eminent role in the whole of the school plays. You know, he's the most popular. He's destined for great things. Now, this is where the little anecdotes are so, so clever. Because, like I say, everything is surface in this book. There's no hidden meanings. And yet, the more and more you think about it, the more and more our heart moments come on. And yet they're done so lightly that it reads like a comic novel, but with a serious undertone. There's no book I've read like this. It was written in 1888, I think, so 130 something years ago. And it reads like the most modern novel I've ever read. It's enduring. You will read it and recognize loads of the things that he talks about. You will giggle because you think that's true. It's funny because it's true. But what makes this so profound a book Despite the fact it breaks all the conventions of realism, it's very much in the vein of realism, but it's got no grand sweep. Um, it, it, do, it talks about ordinary things, but from the upper class perspective, whereas realism normally takes the lower class perspective, the down and dirty, it doesn't have a, a, a grand vista like Middlemarch. And yet it's so real because it touches occasionally on serious matters. Now, he says it all very off the cuff, but you can tell that as a person who is dead, he says, well, you have a lot longer to think when you're dead. Um, and he seems to be somewhat weighing up his life and whether he made a good use of it, how life can be wasted, but overall how arbitrary and painful and troublesome it can be. In fact, he says that at one point through ambition and through love and through hate and vengeance says that life just throws one around like an old rag and 
we instantly recognize that in our own day-to-day -day life. And again, this is one of the things that makes a classic. It speaks to us about life. It reveals something within us that we knew was there, that we know was real, but it shed a light on it to help us see it more clearly. I'll read you a little bit uh, very early on. He doesn't think much about death. He wants to get on with having pleasures in life and all that kind of stuff. But he has this dream, and in this dream he's visited by this spirit called Pandora. It just highlights that in all of our lives, somewhere in the background is the recognition of our mortality. This Pandora speaks to him in the dream and he says he doesn't want to die, let me have a few more years. And Pandora says, a few years would seem like a minute. Why do you want to live longer? To continue to devour and be devoured? Are you not sated with the show and the struggle? You have experienced again and again the least vile and least painful of my gifts. The brightness of morning, the gentle melancholy of dust, the quietness of night, the face of the earth, and last of all, sleep, my greatest gift to man. Poor idiot, what more do you wish? So in other words, this, this, is, this dream is like a premonition. Why do you want to extend life? You may have these brief glimmers and moments, but overall it's painful and you've only had the briefest pleasures that I offer and the lightest pains. Why do you want to extend life when overall it's gonna cause you a load of aggro? But we can't get rid of the desire to live. And so this is sort of the first brush that uh, Brass Cubas has with the idea of his mortality and that life might be pointless. But he's got this pugnacious determination to ignore the fact that he's mortal. It's sort of a willful stubbornness to turn a blind eye to the inevitable. And so he carries on and he goes through his life seeking pleasures, seeking to indulge himself. He talks about there being a trapeze artist in his mind that when it gets an idea it can't let go of it and starts performing all sorts of gymnastics with these ideas. And the one idea he has is um, a plaster, a medical plaster, to get rid of melancholy um, and sadness. And he says, I told my friends, you know, what a boon this would be to civilization. And in his imaginations, he imagines selling it to the government. But he admits, like all of us, he says, it's like a medal though. There's a part facing the public to show them the good it's doing them, but there's another half showing itself to me, or looking back on me, where I can make a great deal of money out of something like this. He says, actually, money's not the chief ambition. It's because I want to see my name in lights. He says, I love billboards and pyrotechnics. He wants to be famous. He wants to be a somebody. And yet, he doesn't want to put in the effort to actually become that somebody. Like, he wastes his time at university. He has opportunities to grow in government, but you know, he's not that interested. And when he does become interested, it's too late for him. And he gets overlooked. So life if we were able to judge it properly at the beginning, maybe we'd make better decisions, but we'd often put the important things to one side. We put our uh, mortality away and just seek the pleasures. And we all relate to this. Later on, we see his mother die, and of course he's stricken with grief. Everything's been pretty plain sailing up to now, apart from not getting Marcella. And when his mother dies, it really sets him back, it shakes him, and again, it makes him think more upon the shortness of life, the exhalation of our existence. And that's when he talks about Shakespeare. He says, I believe, after his mother died, that it was then that the flower of melancholy in me began to open this yellow, lonely, morbid flower with its subtle and inebriating perfume. Tis good to be sad and say nothing. When I read those words of Shakespeare, I felt within me an echo, a delicious echo. And then he says, I pressed my silent grief to my breast and experienced a curious feeling, something that might be called the voluptuousness of misery. Voluptuousness of misery. Memorize this phrase, reader. Store it away. Take it out and study it from time to time. And if you do not succeed in understanding it, you may conclude that you have missed one of the most subtle emotions of which man is capable. 
Now there is a profoundly deep insight into life, the voluptuousness of misery. He's always been about pleasure, about advancing himself, a very egocentric view. But confronted with the death of a loved one, he sinks into thinking and allows himself to dwell on what is serious and melancholy. And it's voluptuous. Something about it touches the heart and the brain. And therein, he's talking about spirituality or meaning. Those things that really do enervate a human person. And they are voluptuous. They touch the emotions in a way nothing else does. So in other words, life, we shouldn't ignore the meaning. We should get into it. But of course, with Brass Cubas, this passes. And then later, there's a little uh, incident where he's in a home, his own home, and there's this black butterfly, and it's on the window. And so he comes in and he said, I didn't like it. It was black. Why did it have to be black? As if it was a harbinger of death. And uh, he says, if only it had been blue. And he thinks, yes, that's a good idea. And it sticks with him. I wish it had been blue. And the reason he says that is he wouldn't have killed it. Because he says, that black butterfly was having a lovely day. Then it flew in through my window, saw me, maybe the first time it's ever seen a man. It flew around me. It saw that I had eyes, nose, mouth. I walked about. It may even have comprehended that I was alive. Perhaps it even thought that was flying around the creator of butterflies. He said, it sat on my head, probably to kiss its creator. He was filled with fear, but an awe. And he's talking about religiosity in the same way that humans have it. They have this awe of creation and want to draw close to a god to say there's a creator of them. And so they pay homage and the butterfly kissed him on the head. And then it flew onto the window and uh, he decided to swat it with a towel. <laughs> and he talks about how lovely this thing is. He says, all the sun, all of the beautiful sky under which it had been, the nectar of the flowers, couldn't protect it from a few inches of flannel. And what that's depicting is just how flimsy life is and how thinking that getting absorbed in all the fun and the, the great things that you can do in life it's so fragile. A bit of flannel can wipe you out. And I think in a way, maybe he's wondering about, well, if there's a God, why is life like this? In fact, later he talks about the church and a girl who's destitute on sitting on and sleeping on the stairs of the church. Well, shouldn't God be interested in her? So all of these things are going on, but he says it with so much humour all the way through. He meets the love of his life, Virgilia. Um, but unfortunately, she chooses another man, not because she loves him more, but that man's determined to be a Marquise and she wants to be a Marchioness. And he says, well, she looked at the eagle and the peacock and chose the eagle. However, it doesn't stop them from then suddenly falling in love at a dance and entering into an adulterous relationship. And he complains, what is morality? You know, what's, <laughs> it only, hinders us, it only crams us in. If only life could be free for us to do whatever we want, surely we would be more happy? Or would they? Because they certainly can't, they, they definitely love each other, and they, but they tire each other out and things get tough and his affair becomes notorious and he feels a bit guilty for the husband, but he's not going to stop doing what he's doing and he keeps telling her to run away with him and then he gets bored of her and then She's going to move away with her husband. And then he suddenly is enamoured of her again. And they're, they're very passionate again with one another. And in all this, he's getting advice from his brother and sister, his sister and brother-in-law, which he doesn't always like. And he begins to see a few more serious aspects of life and thinks I should, maybe I should become involved in the parliament and make a career for myself, but it's a bit too late now. And on top of all of this, he meets up with his old characters. So Marcella, whom he loved at the beginning, this beautiful woman, what's life done to her? Well, he meets her in this little shop. She's ugly. She's got a child, no husband, and she's got some money, but she never amounted to what she wanted to be. She's been used and tossed aside. Life has treated her badly. There's a beautiful girl that he meets who's 16 years old, but he's delighted with her manners 
and yet realises she's lame, as in she limps a lot. And he says, why lame if so beautiful? Life is so arbitrary. Life can be so cruel. He meets Chinkas Borbas, the kid who used to play the king at school, and he's a beggar. But he's got this philosophy, which Bras Cubas likes, called uh, humanitism. And it basically says that you can indulge yourself and do whatever you want because um, humans will, as a one big organism, will correct themselves. If you want to steal and then they hang you, that's just humanity correcting itself and growing. He says, so there's nothing actually morally wrong. Okay. And this allows Cubas to sort of go along with the idea he wants to believe, which is, I can indulge myself. I don't have to worry about morality or immorality, as with adultery. He doesn't have to think about a god. And that's how the story plays out. But it's all surface. And there's some hilarious random deviations where he talks about his opinion on windows. Or have you ever contemplated what the human nose is actually for? And then he realises he's digressed and comes back. And what it shows is life how it is. Life is fits and starts and jolts and bumps. It's never a sequential run. It's never all planned out and mapped out. But there are very vivid moments that we have which stick with us. And always lurking in the background is the knowledge of time tick ticking away. That death is creeping on more and more surely. And what do you do with your life with that in mind? Do you suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Or do you take arms against the sea of trouble? He takes arms against the sea of trouble. He sees others who suffer nobly the slings and arrows. Right at the end, he sums up his life and he takes an accounting. He says, so I've done some bad things. I've done some good things. I've had some fun. I've had some misery. How has my life really worked out? And he does sort of a balancing scale of everything. And he comes out a slight winner. Epitaph of a small winner. He concludes that in the great scheme of things, in life, he succeeded just about because of one thing. He didn't have children. And that means he didn't pass on the suffering and misery that life could bring to another human being. And he thought, that makes me a winner, really. Now, that's a rather macabre and dark conclusion to come to. And one doesn't totally think that Machado Giacis really believes this. But he is getting us to ask the question, what is the point of life? With so much trouble, what is the point of it? And why do we distract ourselves with shiny objects and baubles when there are more serious things to play? Why do we switch off from those moments when we suddenly have a recognition of what is important, the voluptuousness of misery? This book is just great. Really, really get hold of this book. You will not regret it. I know when I read it a second time, so much more came out of it again. And it's one I will return to multiple times. This is a five out of five book from the Brazilian author, Machado Giacis. I urge you to get this book and just enjoy it. So, have you read this book yourself? Leave a comment down below if you have. Um, what are your opinions on it? Did you draw anything else out of it? Um, let me know. In the meantime, I wish you joy in your reading.